Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this keynote session at the Psychology of Global Crises conference. My name is Nicholas Kimiri. I work at Roskilde University here in Denmark, and I have the great pleasure of introducing our upcoming keynote speaker to you, Katrina Hesse from the Danish School of Education at Aarhus University in Denmark. Originally a trained anthropologist, Katrina is strongly inspired by cultural historical psychology that contributed to developing the theoretical framework from her inherently interdisciplinary perspective on learning. It is thus of no surprise I met her for the first time in beautiful Rome at the 2011 ISCAR conference, even though we both actually are situated in Copenhagen. In her research work, Katrina takes a special interest in the relations between culture, learning, concept making, new materialism, post-humanism, gender and education, and she has published extensively on these topics in both English and Danish. In addition to her groundbreaking monograph and anthropology of learning from 2015, I would particularly like to mention her freshly issued monograph entitled Posthumanist Learning, What Robots and Cyborgs Teach Us About Being Ultra-Social. This latter publication is connected to a recently concluded EU project that Katrine led, Responsible and Ethical Learning in Robotics. I'm sure insights from this project will act as backdrop for the keynote talk she will be giving now, namely on how robots change our everyday lives in present times. I wish to encourage everyone to participate in the Q&A discussion here on Zoom right after Katrina's talk, and you're welcome to write questions already in the Q&A tool at the bottom of the screen during Katrina's presentation. But of course, as I said, we'll first pick up the questions after Katrina's done. So now to you, Katrina, we much look forward to your robotic insights. Thank you so much for that nice uh, introduction, Nicholas, uh, and to the organizers for letting me come here to speak. I have to say I would rather be in Paris, but uh, that is the condition we live under these days. A strange condition uh, caused by the coronavirus. And one of the questions I might um, come back to in my talk here is, is there a connection between coronavirus and robots? But let's begin by me sharing my screen with you. And uh, try to see if this is working. Um, so Nicholas, you but you just stop me if it's not working, and if people can't hear me or something. But uh, yes, this is the title of my talk: How do robots change everyday lives? Uh, Nicholas has already uh, introduced me so finely, so I will not go deeper into this. But just to say that uh, I have been working uh, with learning for many years, uh, together with issues of culture and technology. And it is also in this capacity that I study uh, technologies like robots. And I'm running a program at Aarhus University on these issues, very interdisciplinary program. Um, and what we have as a special mark is that we mainly do ethnographic research. So we study wherever we can robots in everyday lives. And I'll present some of these studies for you. And as Nicholas had guessed, I will also uh, present something from the Wheeler project. But then I will move on to what interests me the most. Uh, and I used robots to study what are human beings and what are human learning. And here I will touch upon the issue of ultra sociality, um, which is one of the things that I think really distinguish humans from robots. Uh, and that in, entails also uh, concepts like stretching, work meaning, boundary making. And then I'll round out, up with some speculations about how robots may change our everyday lives. Or, and already do. So everyday lives, you can say they are uh, concrete, contextualized, and first of all, lived. But um, apart from that, they're also in constant flux. So everyday life is a process. And as an anthropologist, as Nicholas said, I've been um, encouraged to, to follow this process uh, as a learning process, because this is what I believe we do as anthropologists. I believe that we study uh, what matters to others in their everyday lives. Um, and 
we do this through a learning process that transform ourselves. So in that sense, as ethnographers, we have to be professional expert learners. So I've studied a number of technologies as an anthropologist and cultural psychologist, because as Nicholas also said, I've been very inspired by uh, cultural psychology, not least the Vygotskian perspectives. But my main interest also following that is not the technologies per se, but the humans that engage with them. Um, and it's the humans that are in focus of my research. But uh, in recent theoretical development, we have uh, become much more aware uh, that we must um, consider a relational ontology where intentionality, as Peter Paul Fabique has put it, is not exclusively hu human, but also extends to the realm of technology. And first of all, to the amalgams of technology and human. Uh, and in these relations, the technologies are not um, uh, having properties uh, just by themselves, but they are just like we are becoming in relations. So to the title of my talk, I prefer to change the question a little bit uh, and then come back to the change later and begin by asking how do robots actually uh, differ from humans in our everyday lives interactions? And uh, that question I uh, can give some tentative answers to from a number of research studies uh, conducted by me and my colleagues at, in the research program for future technology, culture and learning, where we have looked at many different robots uh, implemented primarily in a Danish context, Silbot from South Korea, the Telenoid from Japan, the little French, uh, originally French, now it's changed owners, Robot Now, and Paro, a Japanese robot, all implemented in a Danish context with all the cultural implications that follow from that. And I have this list of, of publications. Uh, I don't expect you to read it, but I'll just say my colleagues have done excellent work. And it's quite rare to see so many studies of uh, especially social robots in the wild. But why should we study robots and engineers at all? Uh, is the robot revolution a crisis? We can ask following the, the theme of this conference. Um, do robots create fiction, the frictions when they enter into people's everyday lives? Well, of course, robots we already know will change the nature of work life and already have. Um, but in Wheeler, we try to go one step deeper and look at how uh, robots are also designed and how much people take into design processes, how uh, people's everyday lives will be affected when robots are implemented in workplaces. Wheeler finished this year uh, and it was a, a study where we, on the one hand, looked at lab studies where robots were made. On the other hand, we looked at the machinery, the robots that were designed, that we understood both as machines, tools, and as conceptual uh, entities. And we also then looked at the people who would be affected by these robots in their everyday lives. And we looked at a number of different robot types from robots in schools, healthcare, construction site robots, and so on. So it was a fairly big project for, uh, for a social science and humanities um, approach. And uh, uh, we've had a number of results that uh, I can um, direct you to a homepage where you can find a lot more. But of course, uh, the reason why we are so in, invested in, in robotic development is that robots are not just machines now. They are connecting a number of things uh, and a lot of software, uh, software equipment. And furthermore, they uh, move closer and closer to our everyday lives. Previously, robots were uh, caged, you call it, 
in the local lingo of roboticists in industrial settings or other settings. Um, but today in the robot revolutions, robots are becoming more and more human-like uh, and they're also coming more and more into our everyday lives in healthcare, in schools, in a number of institutions. And how does that play out? Well, uh, what we see is that it demands some new questions about how robot designers understand humans in everyday lives and how they understand their robots. So a robot for uh, most engineers is an agentic device, uh, something that can um, accomplish a task in the physical world. And it might be directed by some other agents, software agents or humans. But basically it's a mechanical thing uh, running on uh, electronic parts. But some designers also have the ambition and also the way they formulate their work now is that they create autonomous robots. And as with all living things, robots behavior, they say, is uh, produced of the internal states as well as the physical laws. And they don't see the big difference between humans and robots. And of course, that's a challenge that I've picked up when, when robot designers say that they want to copy humans and make uh, robots human-like. Uh, and they believe that this entails um, uh, copying what we are. That's, of course, an interesting challenge for an anthropologist that I've written about in this book on post-humanist learning. But in my perspective, just so you know, robots are first of all platform machines that connect uh, different technologies, many different technologies into this um, entity. And social robots then connect even more than a lot of industrial robots. And that make them a very particular machine because in a way we could be enticed to believe that they can see, they can hear and even think. But in Wheeler, we, uh, we gave what we call a reality check on imagined futures. It turns out most people uh, who have not met robots uh, do not think of industrial robots when they are hearing the, the word robot. They think of creatures like these ones um, that are human-like and even more than human-like. Um, so how will robots change everyday lives? Well, for the engineering uh, point of view, uh, there are some obvious answers because they do view mainly robots as machines that will affect our work life. Humans will, in that respect, lose their jobs. And uh, many of them tell us, like Emilia here, that is not really an option. Uh, we have to have these robots in our lives, also in increasingly in our everyday lives at home, at school, at healthcare, in order to simply um, stay here in, in Europe with, with jobs. Otherwise we'll have no production, as Amelia puts it. Well, uh, these are not just bad things. There are also many good things. New opportunities come up when people lose their jobs. A lot of economists and roboticists also have made that argument. And also that robots relieve people of hard work. Um, and then also that this is a process that has been going on for years and years and thousands of years. Uh, so what is really the problem? Uh, robots are uh, just a normal development of societies. And history have shown, uh, as we also say in perspectives on robots, that we have always uh, been able to adapt to new technologies. But uh, as um, Irving here says, uh, this is uh, maybe an unavoidable development. Um, but we could avoid it, Edwin also says. We could change histor history suddenly. Uh, if that meant development. Well, that would mean, I would argue that we have to know more about what robots are actually doing to humans 
And that means that we know, we have to know better what humans really are. And in robotics, humans are often viewed rather instrumentally. Um, so robots are labor saving machines. Uh, and that means that they can save, um, save workers labor. But what they really mean is that they can save workers and wages. So this conflation, as uh, David Noble says, of work and worker uh, as labor uh, is, is made possible because the concept of human is reducing humans to their productivity. But for anthropologists, of course, this is not the case. Uh, but anthropology itself has also been questioned on the concept of human uh, by the development of theories of the posthuman. The posthuman is on the one hand, um, uh, the amalgamation of human and machine. But that's not what interests me so much. Um, I think we need uh, a, a, a new a redefinition as Francesca Ferrando is saying here, um, that also take into account what humans are in their everyday life. And that's something that is often overlooked by post-humanist theories. Uh, they sort of seem to assume they know what humans are, but I think we need new perceptions of humans, whether they have inbuilt uh, metal parts or not, um, that, that challenge this notion that we know what, what humans are. And here I found inspiration in uh, Michael Tomasello's work uh, on uh, looking into how humans uh, develop. Um, and how they differ from machines and, and non-humans. And um, Thomas Seller has argued that there is something special about humans. Even though we in a relational ontology have decentered the human as the main um, figure in, in relations. We also have to say that uh, humans bring something special to, to these relations. And according to Tomasello, it is that humans are especially cooperative. But what does that then mean? And I've tried to go on uh, a little bit along these lines in my own work and looked at how the study of robots and cyborgs can tell us something about how this also sociality matters. Um, and how these ultra social humans become in these relations with technology. And of course, my point is that, um, my main point is that learning is in the middle of this process and we learn with both our material and social relations. And that means that we change, we transform ourselves in learning with materials. Um, and I think that has also been part of cultural psychology for, for a long, long time, but it has a new actuality now that I think we should uh, be aware of. And when I try to look at these relations between robots and humans in everyday life, I see a need also for an expanded vocabulary um, and uh, a dusting off maybe of some older um, terms. And the new vocabulary I propose um, that also consists of older uh, concepts is stretching word meaning and new boundary making. Now just briefly run over those for you now. But the point of departure is that whenever we look into um, uh, everyday life, a lot of people seem to conceptualize hum uh, robots as human-like, uh, both grown-ups and uh, children that you can see here, we have asked to draw robots in a huge uh, experiment where we visited schools and um, and uh, try to uh, try to look into how uh, children perceived robots. But we also tried to follow a learning process in situ, where we exposed them to robots which they had never seen in real life before. And this is a scene from one of these uh, sessions where the, the um, people meet the now robot uh, that's standing here in a child's chair. 
and the children are, are looking at it. But it also, it was the same kind of process we saw with, uh, with grown-ups um, in the Silbert case, for instance. Um, people uh, in general seem to be very ultra social in the sense that they want to include these humanoids in their social sphere. Um, and they tend to unproblematic at the onset of the meeting, believe that these robots are actually some kind of live creatures. And when we asked children to draw robots, we also saw that uh, we didn't tell them what kind of robots they should draw, but of 195 drawings, uh, only 20 uh, chose to draw um, robots that were not humanoids. There's a lot to be said about that, that I am uh, looking into in my book. Uh, but uh, in, in also this project we had in Skive, in a school and at a museum, we saw that uh, humans reach out to the robots to get contact, to meet it, to be uh, in, in engaging with it. And the robot were, were um, it was programmed to breathe a little and uh, look with its eyes that change colors, uh, but nothing else. And the children were then instructed to sit also one in, by one in front of the robot. And we asked them to just sit still like the robot, but they couldn't. They kept going into a kind of dialogue with the robot, making faces, even though they weren't allowed to talk. They made all kinds of faces to the robot and really, really tried to engage us in a dialogue. And became a little more disappointed over the time because they, they didn't get a response. Um, they didn't get a response that they actually had, had envisioned. And um, uh, they, it was really interesting to see how the, the children tirelessly again and again tried to make this contact. But eventually they began to understand that their stretching did not get the answers, uh, did not include the robot in their social sphere as they wanted. Um, and then they began to look around uh, and in my analysis, they began to understand that there was something a little bit wrong in the concept of the robot as a lively social creature that could just play with them, even though they asked it to. Uh, and here I will move to word meaning uh, that I've learned about from Vygotsky, uh, who has, uh, among many other um, uh, things, this uh, way of describing word meaning, that we can see an object, a material object, like a clock. But we have already uh, internalized some kind of meaningfulness of what we see. And if you have not internalized that, you actually see something white, if you even have internalized white and black and, and red and long uh, lines and some dots and so on. It's actually part of an anthropologist's work to see objects like, like this, because we can't take for granted that what we see is actually not just what we brought with us from home. So I've always found that very helpful for anthropology. Um, but I think this is a basic thing also in how we see uh, every kind of uh, material object. So uh, also when we see a robot, our concept, the word meaning we attribute to the robot comes with us. And since liveliness was part of that, this is what the children saw. But as the children gradually learned that this was not quite what they got, uh, they began to look for something else that could explain and give meaning to the situation. And then they saw something else. They saw that uh, now was tied up with a cord. It was an old fashioned way of doing it in, in 2015, but it actually was very interesting because it made it possible for us to see that uh, now the children began to include the electricity in their liveliness, but also in their concept of the robot. A girl said, I know why there is an outlet. That's how it can be alive. It must have electricity so it can be alive. And then they could begin speculating. Maybe the electricity was off. That was why it didn't come to play. 
But gradually, they also learned from us, from my assistant sitting in the back, uh, that we were in control of now, and now was a machine controlled by us. And there was a computer tied to it and software and all that. And definitely their concept of robots changed. Uh, and this is uh, what I'm uh, using Barad, Karen Barad's work on post-human thinking uh, for, that we are creating new boundaries as we learn uh, as humans. We include a lot of things getting tangled in the amal amalgamations we engage with, but also our concepts uh, get entangled in ways that change their boundaries and thereby also what we perceive, what we see. Um, and here uh, again, uh, we can emphasize with the uh, with, uh, post-humanism that there are no independent objects or we could add independent subjects. We become in relation to each other but we can get deeper into how humans become in these relations. And I have suggested these three concepts for that, stretching, word meaning, and new boundary making. So back to the question of how robots actually change everyday lives. Um, I think it is connected to how robots differ from humans in these uh, interactions in everyday life. Uh, so what we saw in Rila, uh, the project where we studied all these robots uh, and also in some other uh, projects is that uh, the people who work in the, in the care work, for instance, and school work, they will get new boundaries. They will get new con concepts, both of themselves as teachers or nurses, but also at their work and of the robots. And here we see an interesting thing because the robots are not engaging in ultra social learning. And the people who make the robots uh, in Rila we could um, find were not really aware of how people really were in everyday lives. So the, the social situations we created in the project where they learned about humans in everyday life was of great value to them, but uh, it's not something they normally do. So, um, uh, we find, found out that robots, as Anne Schrauber has said, um, are technological tools that are actually materialized action, um, and that this create new boundaries that um, has not been envisioned by the robot designer. Um, and these new boundaries transform not just how we see the robot, but also uh, who we are in these situations. Um, this is not necessarily a bad thing, uh, but um, we also found definitely that sometimes robot makers and staff in care work, for instance, differ in their uh, conceptions of what is meaningful in work life. Uh, like this robot maker says, uh, they, the care staff, just have a different understanding of what is important. It's something for them with relations, human relations, but it's not, it isn't. The most important thing for me, damn it, is not a human relation. Some things we want to do, we want to do alone with human dignity. And of course, we see many examples of his right, uh, but we also see many examples of uh, an ignorance on the part of the robot designers on how they're uh, robots is actually working in everyday life, as you can read in, for instance, Niels Christian Nicholson's uh, excellent paper on the Bestick robot that I, we have a picture of here, but also in Perspectives on Robots, the publication you can find on our work page from, from the RELA project. And I've also previously written about how staff uh, reacted to this kind of change uh, when uh, a nursing home uh, got uh, an introduction to this uh, Japanese uh, uh, robot Paro that was supposed to comfort people with Alzheimer's. Uh, they discovered they, they had al always done this kind of emotional work, sitting, holding old people in their hands, uh, and now they had to delegate it to Paro, and they were really sorry about that. Um, and I'm not sure that the robot designers ever realized things like that. So um, 
a lot of changes will come when more robots come into our everyday lives. Our boundaries and our way of stretching will be um, uh, put to the test. Uh, and our meaning, uh, the way we consider ourselves meaningful, will also change. But the interesting thing is in Rila, when we spoke to cleaning staff in Portugal, um, uh, and other people also engaged in, in, in work that would, could be taken over by robots, uh, and asked them if they would like universal basic income instead. They all said, no, they would never give up just uh, meeting people. They would take the universal basic income maybe, but, but it wasn't the, the work uh, was not um, just a, a source for income. It was also to meet other people. So they would immediately go out and do volunteer work, uh, work voluntarily in kindergarten um, and go to people's houses and, and so on. So humans seek humans in the ultra sociality. Um, and the question is if uh, workplaces where we usually meet each other socially, if it matters if they disappear, uh, is that a crisis? Uh, we don't know really if people will find our other ways to be social, ultra social, uh, and stretch themselves in other things. But it definitely means something that a lot of people um, are not just having their work replaced by robots, but they're also going to work alone with a robot. And that's something we also saw, saw in, in Rila was an issue because people um, might feel it uh, as a problem that the robot is a colleague because it works on algorithms and not on work me meaning, but the robots don't stretch themselves towards humans and uh, they don't help create new and interesting boundaries for our way of being in the world. But of course, as uh, I learned from, among others, Vygotsky, uh, a crisis can be constructive if we use it creatively. So um, I will end my my talk uh, on, on this uh, optimistic note, so to speak, uh, and, and uh, say that um, uh, uh, if we can deal with this crisis, uh, it might bring us to a, a, a better future, but we have to understand what humans are in this crisis. And so what is the connection between COVID-19 and robots? Are there any connections? Um, and I would say, yes, the connection I see is they both, they both separate people, put, put us apart from each other, physically at least. Uh, and this conference in, in itself is an example of this. Normally we would uh, meet each other in the hallway, we'll have coffee, we'll talk together. And I, I really appreciate the organizers' uh, many efforts to make us meet in, in virtual space, bring your own food, bring your own drinks. It's great, um, we can do that. But I also hear from my, my colleagues, uh, we had a talk yesterday, that people get tired. Somehow there is something called Zoom fatigue. And one of my colleagues even talked about Zoom depression. Um, uh, and, and I think it's part of this ultra social human being that we, we want to be present physically as well. It has some costs only to meet in flat versions like this. Um, and that might be, you know, something that, that connects robots and, and uh, coronavirus, that they sort of separate our social spaces uh, that makes us ultra social. And then the questions of course could be, will we stop stretching or will we stretch more when we don't meet each other in workplaces um, and only have, uh, meetings in our homes with other people or, or in our hobby time. Uh, and also um, what actually will happen to our conceptualizations, not just of ourselves, but also of the world. Uh, if our meaning and boundary making primarily come from meeting, meetings with, uh, with robots that are designed by robot makers that often really don't understand uh, our everyday lives. So uh, on this little less optimistic note, I shall end my, my talk here and uh, come back to you, Nicholas.
it took a little less time than I expected. But <laughs> yes, but that is wonderful because that gives us ample time for discussion. Um, so thank you so much, Katrina, for your great insights and uh, into yeah, learning from robots, but also learning with robots uh, about what it means maybe also to be a human. I mean, it seems to be an opportunity, especially in order to specify further what it means to uh, actually be um, what we are, who we are. So um, so thank you very much. And uh, I just would like to encourage everyone to use the Q&A tool at the bottom of the screen in order to post questions to Katrine. And uh, there was already one question about uh, your PowerPoint presentation and a link in it, uh, but we could just uh, say that uh, we, we can maybe share some of the links that you have in your presentation later on in Slack. That would be probably the easiest thing to do. Yeah. Yes. But, but as, uh, while we're waiting for uh, some questions to drop in, it usually takes a few minutes until people have gathered their thoughts uh, and, and uh, also uh, used the tool. I would maybe like to ask um, just sort of also because you talked a lot now about the Reela project. Um, and I think it would be very interesting to hear a bit more about sort of how to say some of the translation work, some of the conceptual translation work uh, that you uh, may have needed to engage in in order to be able to cooperate and uh, learn together with, uh, for instance, the engineers uh, yeah. that you have been talking about. Um, I was just thinking now one of the examples that you mentioned was sort of this uh, quote about human dignity, uh, but without human relations. Uh, that seems to be an interesting way of sort of uh, thinking dignity, for instance. But yeah. uh, but maybe you can just yeah, say a bit uh, about how that, that worked out and uh, what it craved also to be able to be social with them. Yeah, can I share the screen again? Because then I will just show our homepage uh, that, oh, might, um, that might uh, give some of the questions here. Let me just see if I can find it here. Uh, can you see it? Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, we, can. we have a, a home page here um, uh, called the um, this is the actual actual home, uh, a reality check on imagined futures. And, um, and here we present all of our research. Uh, and maybe I can just go over it very briefly since we have a lot of time and I took a lot of that <laughs> out. <laughs> so, so and then come back to your question. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so in this um, homepage, uh, we are, we argue for our sort of so to speak main conclusion that the robot developers, which are not just engineers but also, for instance, um, application experts and um, uh, spokespersons and facilitators who who actually give funding for robots, um, uh, in general know very, very little about um, not just the end users, because often people have uh, engaged with, with end users somehow, but uh, the other groups that we identified, directly affected stakeholders and distantly affected stakeholders, are often left completely out of design work. And that's, for instance, uh, an end user can be a patient in a wheelchair, but a, direct, a directly affected stakeholder is a nurse, for instance, that has to help the patient uh, get into the robots or, or engage with the robots. In this case, uh, an exoskeleton, for instance. Um, so, so a lot of this uh, uh, needed this kind of translation work um, in the sense that uh, many uh, people who made robots uh, spoke about end users. But when we went more narrowly into what, what did they actually refer to, an end user, for instance, could be the manager of a hospital uh, and not the person who was going to use the robot and definitely not the nurse who was going to implement the robot. So in that sense, um, we, had, we, we found out in the project how different people understood different concepts as, as we went along among these uh, end user. Um, and then uh, if I can just move on here, uh, we tried to, to take our research that we did in a collaboration with engineers and, and um, economists and anthropologists uh, and created a common um, language, so to speak, that we had uh, identified along the way in the project um, that we now have implemented as a toolbox 
we also uh, where you can try different games and stuff like that. Uh, but then we also have uh, a lot of outreach uh, tools. We made mini publics. Uh, we used action methods, uh, different kinds of drama play, and we have some policy recommendations. But under research, we have uh, both uh, this uh, big publication where we discuss all of these things, um, but also a research repository. And in the research repository, you find a lot of extra uh, working papers where we uh, go more deeply into particular cases. For instance, the Bistik case I was talking about. Um, and this was exactly the case where you saw uh, the best intentions, like in, often the roboticists have the best intentions of making the best robots. And, and in this case, they wanted to make uh, uh, people who are lame in their arms, more independent and, uh, and, uh, and give them the opportunity to be able to, to eat a meal uh, just by having a robot feeding them uh, instead of being fed by a human person. We also have, of course, uh, uh, toilet robots and stuff like that, that are all along the same line, something that gives people a bigger independent existence. But because uh, everyday life is complex and, and a part of a long uh, learning process that makes people not so much alike like robots, um, and because the robots cannot respond to these situated practices, um, we also saw that even these robots with the best intentions for some users turned out to be catastrophic. Mm. Uh, uh, both, of course, because their eating habits, they couldn't adapt to the robots' movements and the robots couldn't adapt to them. And the robot designers had no idea that so much adaption was needed because when they tested the robots, sometimes they even did it on people uh, with no disease at all. Uh, and sometimes they did it with, with end users um, that actually had that disease they wanted to cure with a robot or help with a robot. But, but they didn't do it. They didn't do studies of everyday life. So the moment uh, you left the laboratory and the robot was supposed to stand on his own feet, so to speak, all these problems appeared. And this was a consistent pattern throughout Rila that there is a lack of, of these understandings. And it is very difficult to bring it back to the engineers. And that's partly also due to a, um, the, the power balance, I would say, between uh, their discipline and our discipline, mm -hmm. disciplines. But it helped we had engineers and economists on board in the project. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's very interesting actually to think about this notion of independence that uh, is ingrained in that understanding and, and it seems as if sort of it is especially a form of social flexibility that uh, goes missing basically when actually robots are taken into action in everyday life, um, that your concept of ultra sociality may be um, sort of pointing to, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, we have a couple of questions that I would just read them up to you so you don't have to worry about reading them yourself. Um, and, uh, and they are concerned about... One at the time, maybe. <laughs> Pardon? One at the time, maybe. Yes, yes of course, of course. Um, and they, uh, but they are also connected to some extent, but I'll read them one, uh, one at a time. So uh, Martin is asking, um, uh, he's trying to bend his head around uh, this. So the robot as a deliberately artificial object that imitates human beings, but leaves a gap to us. In a weird way, it's a play with anthropomorphism. I'm thinking of the Freudian uncanny. Do you have ideas about that? How do we connect psychologically to deliberately artificial imitations of human beings the robot as a fantasy of the other. Great question. Yeah, so if, if, uh, if you visit this homepage and go to this publication, Perspectives on Robots, you will see a, a chapter on uh, robot imaginaries. And in that chapter, there's a picture of um, uh, a, a, a robot made by a Japanese robot designer called Ishiguro, who's quite famous for making replicas of human beings. And 
uh, these robots are, are real replicas of human beings. Uh, I mean, it's, they're literally copied from his own looks, you know, uh, and we were told that he has to redo this robot from time to time and also himself go through facial surgery in order to keep them, uh, the robot and himself look alike. So, so that's really an extreme case. But there's also a picture of a person sitting, uh, seen from the back in front of a screen. Uh, and that person is me. And I'm actually controlling Ishiguro as a robot in another room. Mm -hmm. And what struck me when we visited his lab was uh, that this uh, robot that Ishiguro, ha he has toured the whole world with that, and also other uh, like robots, and also Henrik Schärfe from the Danish context has, has also toured around with a robot uh, that was a copy of himself. Um, and what struck me was how sim simple they were and how willing we are to perceive them as uh, live creatures. In fact, they were what, what the roboticists call Wizard of Oz technology. That means they are controlled. They are like mobile phones, basically, we can say. So they are controlled by a human being. Uh, when people meet them, they are flabbergasted because the robot will will answer questions and talk to you as a human being and, and ask you about your glasses and your, your scarf and everything that, that makes you really think the robot is alive. But once you visit these laboratories, you know why that is. So we have never seen any robot that actually could uh, understand anything near to what humans can understand. I mean, robots can, are not meaning makers. Uh, so the anthropomorphism stops at a point. It stops with looks. It looks like human beings. And we are so willing to stretch ourselves into these uh, creatures that we attribute them all kinds of social um, uh, behaviors and, and, and attitudes and meanings and so on. And that's not only our research that show that, also Miranda Alec has shown that and, and others. So, so this is a, an interesting thing in relation to human beings, yeah. Thank you. And uh, yeah, and actually uh, one of the questions uh, nicely picks up on this, because where does actually this expectation, this uh, discourse maybe, or whatever one wants to call it, uh, come from, right? And uh, Ines Langemeyer is writing, uh, thanks for your nice presentation, Katrina. I'm wondering whether the humanizing expectations and reactions to robots are stimulated by science fictions, uh, so movies and books, and uh, thus are just overplaying the deeper dimension about the different social and societal interests, interests that refer to rationalization, for example. And people always find out that this is also humiliating, especially if they lose their jobs or are in danger of losing their jobs. Yeah, great question. Thank you, Ines. Uh, yeah, but um, uh, I have, uh, I, for those who know me, you know that I began by studying uh, natural sciences uh, and physics education. And one of the surprising things to me there was how much physicists were influenced by science fiction. Not in all places because there were cultural differences, uh, not so much in Italy, um, but very much in, in Denmark and, and the Anglo-Saxon uh, part of the world. And, and we find exactly the same with the engineers. So the engineers are in general fascinated by science fiction and in some sense also can see it as a kind of directing uh, force that, uh, that will make them try to create these human-like creatures. Um, and somehow these visions, uh, which are in many way, ways fascinating, interesting, have reached us uh, through movies like Star Wars and uh, Star Trek and uh, a lot of other uh, newer things, um, uh, uh, also newer movies like Ex Machina. Um, and, uh, and, and all of these movies make use of a lot of technology, a lot of interesting new developments in the creation of technology, but, um, but it's a fantasy. 
and it's a fantastic world, uh, but it's it's only a story. And these stories, when we are uh, when we meet them in media, for instance, or in in pictures of Ishiguro with this robot, these conceptualizations of robots uh, have these boundaries of the fantasy as a reality. Um, and this reality does not include uh, problems of everyday lives. Uh, uh, how can you have a robot help you get your children from kindergarten or um, you know, iron your, your, your clothes and stuff like that? Uh, they, they are much more fantastic creatures that just engage with you in lively human-like ways, um, like the drawings that were made by the children. So that's the one part of the way we uh, robots are perceived. But then, of course, there's a huge um, culture around uh, robots as uh, that, that will um, um, create another kind of labor force. And, and that, that's much, much more prosaic and, and much less uh, towards the human, humanoid uh, side. Um, and they would like to relieve people of tedious work, they believe, like ironing and, and that. Uh, and uh, but then when we go out and, and ask people if they really want to be relieved of cleaning work and uh, hard lifting work and so on, some people would like it, but other people will not like it. Uh, and, and so these situations are much more complex in people's everyday lives than the robot designers realize. So I don't know if you, I, I answered your question, Ines. I wish I, I could sit face to face with you <laughs> and discuss these things, but uh, yeah. So, and it is a problem for, for society, of course, that we, we have so few other fantasies uh, that has the same kind of effect and power as these uh, robotic fantasies. Uh, it is as if our human sciences have given up telling these grand stories uh, and the grand stories are now left to the tech giants and the uh, technology people who are in many ways uh, incredibly creative and, and interesting people. But I think they stand a little bit alone in the, um, uh, from where they can tell the stories of how society should develop. Yes, and I think, uh, yeah, I mean, that's something maybe to return to also later, I think what the, what role psychology, for instance, can play in this, right? But um, I think uh, I would just like to follow up quickly, because uh, it's interesting about uh, the discussion about science fiction, that there's, of course, also a lot of science fiction that actually shows uh, how difficult it is for humanoid robots to be or uh, simulate being human. Uh, and uh, these kind of fantasies in a way uh, have disappeared or seem to be at least uh, very much downplayed in these times because I think there's uh, many, many, many examples of, of robots in conflict basically. Um, but, but these don't seem to be very um, present at least in the studies that you have made, right? No, but you could also say that the, the, the robots we encountered, the problems and the frictions that appeared in the encounters with, with these real robots were very far from the, the encounters that create friction uh, in Frankenstein, for instance, or uh, other, other types of, of fantasy robots. Uh, it, it's not, it's not um, you know, Asimov, uh, the, the famous science fiction writer, has had an, a huge impact on the engineers with his three uh, rules for, for ro robots that mm. um, they shouldn't, uh, it, it can, it, it should always in the end take care of, of the human, it has to decide so it doesn't um, actually kill off uh, a human being uh, and but also protect itself and that that can become a conflict. Uh, but in our in, in our studies, there are no robots that can ever come into that kind of conflict, because mm. they don't have that kind of of um, being in the world. I mean, they are machines and they, they don't come into um, dilemmas like that. Uh, they will do what they are programmed to do. Even machine learning is uh, about programming right. Uh, it's about uh, dots that can be recognized. It's about um, 
zeros and ones and open and closed gates. Uh, and, and in the end, I mean, it's, it's completely fascinating what robots can do, but it's also really important that we understand what they cannot do. And the, the frictions that robot create, robots create in everyday lives are uh, very much tied to their malfunction as not being like humans, you know, they don't understand when, when, when they all of a sudden stop because somebody has pressed a button um, uh, on a on a robot in a hospital and it stopped in the middle of the hallway. That's one case we had, um, and the nurses were running around and becoming more and more angry because why didn't it move? You know, and it was just a matter of understanding how it worked and you had to press this button button then it would move. But instead they were kicking it, you know, because it was it was disturbing their their work. Um, and the robot, what did that do? There, it was just standing there, you know, uh, waiting basically for somebody to press a button. Uh, so these, it, they are just machines, um, uh, but it's interesting how we attribute so much uh, human, um, human aspects to, to these machines. And, uh, and I think, you know, robots can be really helpful in everyday lives, but, uh, but we have to understand these everyday life much better uh, and designers have to understand these lives much better. Thank you. Um, I will read a question by uh, Alfonso Williams, um, who says, fantastic talk. Robots are the product of intense imagination and yet simultaneously reduce intense activity in everyday life. But this also indicates a split between those who can create robots and those who cannot. Do you think this potentially creates empathy problems on the manufacturer's side in caring more about the robot's welfare than the everyday constituent because their personal welfare is closer to the robot by working on it? That's a wonderful question. Uh, I, 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 really, I really think you have a point there because, uh, uh, but I think robot designers are humans just like the rest of us, uh, and uh, and we tend to to love the things we create, you know. Uh, and we will be sorry if somebody is destroying our uh, work. Um, and we have had some cases of what is called robot sabotage or robot sabotage, where where people have um, have put um, screwdrivers into the robots eye or, or body or something like that. And it really hurts the robot makers. I mean, they, they, they do feel for their creatures, um, uh, but at the same time, they also realize they are machines. So uh, it's, it's a strange mix of, of investing a lot of emotions, um, but also uh, in, in a cool way, making robots emotional uh, by changing their facial expressions. For instance, uh, if they want to avoid that person's kick a robot, they might put a face on it that will look sad, you know, if, uh, if somebody tries to kick it. Um, and uh, the thing is, it, it often works. You know, um, another little story from the field was the, uh, a group of robot designers that created little robotic boxes that would uh, go along the corridors in hospitals uh, delivering goods different places. You find many of those, many places, but in, in, in hospitals, but also in, um, I think, airports, um, people kept tripping over these uh, things. And uh, the robot designers, they didn't like that, of course, uh, but also because they it was uh, it was valuable equipment and so on, but also they they thought it was rude of the people just pushing it over or, or uh, yeah um, not taking a, account that this robot was coming. But then they got the bright idea of putting eyes on the robot, just two dots, you know, and immediately people began to behave differently. So they this kind of uh, anthropomorphization really works for humans you know so they began uh, letting it uh, letting it have its way and say oh i'm sorry i tripped over you if they did and so on so uh, so these things uh, work yeah both ways 
Mm. But there is also, I think in your question, there is something also about a power relation maybe between those who create robots and those who, who will live with them. And we have tried through what we call mini publics to let people meet each other on more equal terms uh, to de debate what kind of effect could robots have in their lives uh, when you were, for instance, an uh, industrial worker or healthcare worker or school, school teacher or something. Um, but of course, these were artificial settings. Uh, but I think we could have some more of these dialogues because a lot of the engineers are actually interested in this. They want to learn more about everyday lives. So, um, yeah. It's interesting. There seems to be sort of a complementary movement between sort of some of the robot manufacturers, maybe uh, upscaling, if you wish, the sociality of their robots. But at the same time, also that, <clears throat> well, uh, the way that we also maybe envision work life nowadays and maybe all the other aspects of everyday life, uh, rationalizing it, uh, rendering it more productive. You mentioned the nurse that somehow gets annoyed by the robot that doesn't work the way it's supposed to. It's as if sort of uh, we are also moving closer to uh, robot reality in our ways of maybe thinking sociality at work and in other instances of everyday life. Yeah, Is that, that also something you see? Yeah, yeah that, that was some of the worries I, I pointed to in, in the end here. I don't know if it's, uh, we don't have real studies over time mm -hmm. um, because it's really difficult to make uh, like this. But, uh, but, but following these thoughts about how humans' conceptualizations and stretching and boundary making are transformed, uh, you could speculate that if we mainly engage with robots in our workplace, it, it will have some, some serious effects on our sociality. I mean, um, uh, but it's, it's, it's dangerous because we live in this, uh, in this great narrative of the technology. So, so you often uh, have to defend, you know, questions like that and say, oh, I'm not, I'm not a Luddite or something. Uh, and I'm not, I really, I really appreciate a lot of, of these developments, but I think it's about time we also begin to see that we are, as uh, Ernst Schrauber has said, we are, uh, robots are, are also engaging with us as uh, materialized action, and uh, and we are malleable in in that uh, in that relation. And the robots are less malleable. You know, the the robot designers uh, could be moved to change things, but there is sort of delay a delay between uh, the way they design their robots and the way we uh, change as human beings. And that could be a worry for for the future and also for psychology because a, a lot of this change i guess is connected to uh, psychological issues you know like perception learning um, memory i don't know a lot of a lot of things that that can be affected if you mainly interact with an algorithmic being you know and especially if you are in the position that you sort of take it to be a human uh, then I think what we said in Relay is that our bandwidth will be will, will become smaller uh, in a way because the, the algorithms are not nearly as um, culturally productive as, as human engagements. Uh, and, and we draw as humans on a, a huge uh, pool of cultural resources that are called forth in, in situated uh, actions and, uh, and robots do not have access to that. They only have the representations that have been implemented uh, and learned or relearned, but uh, from the initial understanding of what the robot should learn, you know. So, so I think um, there might be some issues about the richness of concepts that we have to face uh, that, that might be uh, impoverished. Uh, but then again, it's uh, we don't know. You know, we can also human beings might react in many uh, unexpected ways. We might use uh, a robotic society to to have a new kind of freedom to do all kinds of other interesting things. Um, if, of course, uh, we have the possibilities to do that, you know. 
that's that's a political issue as well. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, we have also a comment and question from Gordana Jovanovic, um, which goes into a very similar direction, I would say. Um, Thank you, Katrina. I'm glad to see you after our collaboration on the book on cultural psychology. Is it possible that we are so generous in investing in robots more human traits because uh, it is nevertheless easier with robots? I mean, it could be a kind of reactive uh, formation in psychoanalytic sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you, you could be, I mean, robots are definitely easier to handle than human beings. Uh, and they are, they are created in a particular cultural context, I would say, that also equip with them with particular uh, attributes. Um, and um, uh, of course, you, you could say a robot can malfunction, and then it might be devastating. But But in terms of being a, a, a reliable workforce, for instance, uh, robots don't need holidays. They don't need, um, they, they don't stay home from work because they broke up with their girlfriend and all that. So they are in all these respects different from, from humans. Um, and of course, in, in the capitalist society we live in, uh, they, they count as a much more efficient workforce and human are also um, as David Noble was pointing to in one of the quotes I had um, uh, compared to robots in a way I mean we are we are we are uh, we're seen as humans uh, with the same glasses as uh, people see uh, as at least as uh, many uh, robot investors see uh, Uh, humans and robots as a labor force, you know, and, and there the robot is simply uh, trumping the human all the time because they are um, like, like the Duracell rabbit, they can just go on and on, they need some oil and, and uh, maintenance, but apart from that, they, um, they are not like humans. Um, and of course, they are also worried that humans will sabotage the robots. So. So uh, they worry about how you can keep humans from robots. We're also discussing that in, in our publication that some robot designers uh, want to have the robots um, uh, for themselves, so to speak. They want humans out of the loop completely because humans are actually, some of them said they're messing things up. You know, they, they spoil the system. Um, so in that respect, it, it could be you know, uh, that the, the wet dream of an engineer is, is a labor force entirely without humans or only with humans that come in once in a while and, and, uh, and help, uh, and help uh, maintain the robots. And then what happened to, to humans with all that fantasies and dreams and everything? What, what, all of a sudden we are different kind of humans because we are now in, in that vision we will be superfluous humans we will be different kind of humans yeah but it seems as if this uh, sort of wet dream that you refer to is also part of being human right i mean the the rationalization and the productivity sort of uh, discourse is something that we also have created um, and i don't know i mean there was something i was wondering how does that fit actually into our Uh, thinking us human beings as, as ultra social. Yeah, so, so this is something I didn't touch so much upon here, but we're not just ultra social. Uh, we are also in our ultra sociality, cultural in collective ways. <laughs> And I try to, uh, to discuss that in the, in the book, uh, Post-Humanist Learning, that, where I suggest that, um, uh, that, that we are a kind of uh, walking collectives. I think that's also inspired by the, the Vygotskian uh, literature. Uh, we are walking collectives that meet collectives that are both social and material. So we are collectives of collectives, so to speak. And, and in this uh, ongoing process of collectivity, we, we tend to form collectives around our material practices and these uh, 
practices differ. Uh, if you if you have hands-on experiences with robots, uh, you get a completely different uh, concept of what a robot is. Uh, and and if you don't have, if you only know robots from movies and so on, you get another kind of uh, perception. So these cultural diversities are really important. Um, and also we see that robots uh, are different um, in, uh, and, and perceived different in different cultures. Uh, Japan is one example. Uh, we don't we don't in Denmark see, we see the robots that are implemented from Japan, they are reacted to in rather different ways um, uh, in, in our um, Danish uh, culture of care. And also the, the robots from South Korea, Lasse Blunt, uh, um, a former PhD student and connected to our program has written extensively of, about this and how a robot is becoming differently in different cultural contexts. So. So I don't know if that answered your your question, but I think culture is also a matter we have to think about when we talk about ultra social humans. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, maybe a last uh, final question, because we also uh, have to end around four minutes. Um, yeah, returning to the question maybe of what um, psychology and psychologists can maybe contribute with in this, uh, yeah context uh, i can uh, i remember don Eide speaking about uh, research and development philosophers i think it was around 1990 um so is that something similar you may be envisioning also for psychology psychologists uh, in the context of developing yeah robots and maybe other machines also yeah i i am not a psychologist i have to say <laughs> so uh, so i i don't know uh, uh, i would like psychologists to make some some more explicit visions for society uh, i know you already have but uh, but but maybe you maybe not just building on the robots but also uh, try to do other kinds of visions some of the things we we can see is that um some of the the tasks that that people develop robots for can actually be be solved by by other people, you know, uh, and maybe in a better way. And I think psychologists uh, um, can 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 try and develop their discipline to uh, to not just answer to the technology, but but to um, uh, to stick to the humans in a way and try and and make the humans not the center stage it was uh, before post-humanism, but really saying that it matters how we understand the decentered human. The decentered human uh, should be a, a, a topic of, of psychology, I think, you know, because uh, a lot of the post-humanist theories, they are not taking it into account. Uh, uh, and I'm, of course, very inspired by post-phenomenology uh, but also here, I think they lack um, they lack this uh, deep understanding of of human psychology in these uh, relational ontologies. So, what is it human humans bring to the meeting with this, with the technology that makes us become together? That's something that's that's still lacking, uh, I think, in in this um, area of, of research as well. So better conceptualizations that actually avoid that we start simulating robots, I would maybe say. Yeah, I, I, I don't think a, a lot of humanists have actually gone that way, Nicholas. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting that I have myself and a lot of other humanists have given up studying literature and now do uh, Google Word clouds and I don't know what. Uh, but I think it's time also to reconsider and come back to our our core uh, knowledge uh, and, and uh, insights, and then try to build new, new interesting questions and stories from, from that. But not, not dismiss technology, of course not, but simply look at it as, as this relational becoming, uh, but also take humans seriously in this relational becoming. 
wonderful closing words. Uh, thank you so much, Katrina, and uh, thank thanks to every thank you and thank you to everybody out there participating. Thank you very much, all of you. I, I'm so sorry I can't have coffee with you now. <laughs> That will happen again eventually, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, you're welcome to continue uh, the discussion on Slack. That's the platform that we're using for that. And uh, yeah, so you're welcome to also post questions at the later stage. And hopefully Katrina can then also drop in and maybe look at them at some point. Yes. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Katrina and everybody. And uh, yeah, talk to you soon again.